Hey guys, welcome to the show. My guest today is Marius Lauber, AKA Roosevelt. But before we get to the interview, I'd like to introduce my special guest co-host for today, Demi Ramos. Demi, how you doing? Hello, I feel so honored to co-host today uh, for Pop Dust and The Real with Jordan. Super exciting. You, just some background on you, you are a musician, you're a guitar player, you have your own bands. So you've been working on some kind of EP or album right now, right? Yeah, there's a project in the works, um, so stay tuned. And when you're not making music, you're also a fancy ass model. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I model full time and apparently now I co-host for every now and then for the real. Yeah, and you also enjoy eating icing straight out of the... <laughs> <laughs> you just put me on the spot. Yeah, we just shot yesterday and um, because Jordan's actually a super talented photographer for music and fashion as well so he came over and we shot and I was eating icing the entire time how do you feel are you uh are you ready for this are you a little nervous have you hosted anything before in your life I used to be a super groupie and go ask bands from the underground scene in Brooklyn uh questions before I even started my own band I would go to the shows and I'd be like so astonished I'd go ask and play journalist to underground bands and um, just ask them the silliest questions about, you know, the music and whatnot. So you're, you're ready. You've been, pre- you've been prepping for this. You've been kind of, you know, this is a, this is a natural progression of that. For sure. And I think it's super important that um, we ask certain kind of questions to these artists because not only do the fans want to know, but there's certain things about the artists that they want their fans to know about them. And that's why I think these kind of podcasts are so important. You, I know that you, you're asking, you're going to ask some questions about multiple things, but how interested, interested are you in his musical process? He is this synth geek and he's this DJ. So are you going to ask a bunch of like really intricate gear questions? Yeah. So rumor has it that this guy was DJing parties before his solo project took off and he was in a band and he you know he writes and he produces and he records his own thing and i think that's so rare to find somebody you know an artist that isn't a puppet in the industry that's writing that's recording and producing everything it's it's super personal to him so that's why i think it's such a cool project if you're not aware of roosevelt he is a german-born dj producer songwriter musician singer he has two full-length albums to his credit and he just released a single called Sign. Uh, we're going to talk about that and whatever else he has going on. Marius Hello. is coming on. Marius, how you doing? Hey, guys. Hi. Hi. I'm good, thanks. How are you guys? We are good. So I'm Jordan, and this is Demi, my co-host. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi, guys. So first of all, we would like to talk about Sign, your newest single, Right. Yeah. So tell me how that was created. And uh, yeah, just give me a little background about that song. So we t- we were touring Young Romans, the last album, um, pretty long and with pretty, like a pretty um, extended tour, a lot of festivals um, over two years. And then it was kind of time to go back into the studio. And it feels like Young Romans had this really rich and um expansive band sound throughout the record so i you know rec- recorded guitars and drums for each track because i kind of wanted to experiment uh how much of a band sound i can create on my own um in the studio but when i get got back in the studio i kind of i was influenced a lot by more electronic music and kind of what i was listening to a lot when i started Roosevelt, so I kind of it felt a lot like going back to the roots in terms of production. So I didn't just use the computer as a kind of mixing desk, but this time I actually like worked a lot in the DAW and yeah, it felt a lot more like a track made inside of the computer, um, so to speak, um, with a lot of tools and with a lot of synthesizers. Um, that are outboard and not in the computer, but it it um, 
Yeah, it definitely has more of an electronic vibe again. I think it's the first track I did in a very long time without any real drums and real guitars. Yeah, it was the first thing I I did um, when I went back uh, in the studio, and that was around November, December last year. It took me a really long time to finish it, but uh, yeah, it was the first kind of um, idea that I had. Even on tour, I, I, I remember I had it on my laptop on the road, and then I, I did it in the studio. Is this going to be part of uh, a bigger project, an album or an EP or something? Uh, it will be, yeah. Um, <laughs> early stages? You're in the early stages? I wouldn't even say that. Like I, 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 I went to the studio like every day from November to April or something. Um, I, like whoever knows me knows that I'm kind of, um, I want to work in an album format. So it's definitely, um, there's going to be an album at some point. I have an important question about the song. Sure. What is it about? <laughs> what um, is the song about? To be honest, nobody specific. Uh, I mean, everything I write has a certain, like, autobiography. By, Biographic, is that an English word? Yeah. Biographic. Yeah, that's totally. Um, yeah, it always has something to do with my past and what I experienced. But um, so it, it speaks from a certain emotion that I had, maybe a couple of times in my life. But it's it's not about a certain, like a specific person. I would say. You I were, think even if it was, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Yeah. How <laughs> was Demi, you you were, you really wanted some juicy gossip I know, there. I was like, let's just get to it. Who's this person? No, there's, there's two other versions of this song. You have the the piano version, the stripped down version, which I want to talk. I'll talk about it in a second. But you recently, I mean, just what, about a week ago, you released the Alex Metric remix. A couple things about that is when you when someone remixes one of your songs, do you give them any indication on how it should be remixed or what you'd like to hear? And what do you think about what he did with this track? I never tell people um, what I want a remix to be like. You always hope for something, and that's also how you pick um, people. Um, but from remixing myself a lot over the last six, seven years, I know that you know as a remixer, you just want to have a certain freedom. And it's even when I do remixes, I even sometimes um, don't even listen to the original track. Like I just get the stems. Um, like I maybe listen to it like once, but I'm. It's good to have like fresh ears on the material and just maybe hear the vocal, and do something completely new without being like biased by by the original. Um, so I think as a remixer, it's good to um, be as free as possible from any reference or um, what the you know original artists wants with it. But I think he he stands for a certain style. Um, he has a, his sound is pretty modern, but it still has a lot of like '90s techno vibe in it, uh, which I love. Yeah, it's it's like it's uh, the remix is like nine minutes long or something, and it it has yeah. like a, more of a club feel to it. Yeah, I mean, in the end, he did exactly what I hoped for. So, Sign has these elements um, that are like very influenced by club music. Those vocal samples, which is actually my own voice, and then pitched down. So I had to record it like three half steps, um, pitched up, and then pitched it down again. Um, which is something I did um, on some of my first tra tracks a lot, and I kind of forgotten about that technique, and I quite quite love it. Um, and he kind of emphasized these and kind of, yeah, built like a really hypnotic, um, um, yeah, like a dance floor yeah. boom, uh, around it. And um, yeah, it's, a sh it's a really a shame with that one, especially to, you know, not being able to listen to it in a club environment or like how DJs play it out. And um because that's always exciting to me with remixes when you, even when you just hear or uh, see little video snippets of someone playing it, you know, in a huge room on Ibiza or something. Um, and the, and the remix kind of takes a life on, on, on its own. Um, so it's a shame that's not possible with that one, because I think it really is like a, such a good dance floor track. 
And you also have the piano, the stripped down piano version, which is gorgeous. And I love Thank that. You. I love that you can see in the video. And it, it, once you stop listening to this interview, go check out the video for that. Check out all the, the, um, the both videos. You have an official video, which is really cool in the piano version. In the piano version, you can see your keyboard and synth collection. And there's that sweet Juno 60 sitting on top there. Do you have a big synth collection? Are you a big gear hoarder person? Yeah, well, that's my studio. I mean, it used to be just a room with four white walls like a year ago. This is your personal studio. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness, it's um, like a laboratory. I mean, it's, it was kind of the aim to build like a half circle around me and everything's ready to record and everything's connected and um, I can just go in and, you know, to, for example, today, I mean, it's 7, 10 p.m. already in Germany. So today I recorded a whole song, you know, I, I recorded drums. I, I need an environment like that. Like I worked in a couple of big studios. Um, there's a uh, energy drink brand who runs a couple of studios uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. And they have, um, you know, huge studios, which are really impressive, but you need two hours just to set everything up and it just confuses me. And I, I, I really can't work like that. Um, I, I, it needs to be really impulsive. I need to grab the bass guitar and just play something. And 10 seconds, it needs to be ready. Because otherwise, you know, an, an inspiration or an idea can, can go away super quickly. Are you really disciplined with your recording? Do you get up pretty early in the morning? Or are you one of those 2 a.m. kind of people? Uh, it depends. I mean, I, I try to, I have times where I'm really annoyed when I sleep too long, but I try to just be in the studio for uh, a, a certain amount of time, no matter how my sleeping rhythm looks at the moment, you know, um, because at this, at the same time, like you, you kind of thrive for like a healthy and normal sleeping rhythm, but at the same time, you know, uh, it's kind of my achievement that I can do this at whatever time I want. So um, it's, it's usually it's like when I'm writing and starting an album or new material, it's pretty late. Uh, it can go to like 5 a.m. Um, and I would sleep until noon. Um, and then when it comes to mixing, because I also mixed the, all the new material, which is coming up and also sign, I mixed by myself. Um, Kind of for the first time in a, in a long time. Uh, Chris Cody is based in LA. He makes the first two albums, and I now mixed them myself and stuff like that is usually happening more in the morning it's because you kind of need fresh ears and it's it it feels more like work in a way, um, and it has to I think. And then the more How's the quarantine been for you. Are you writing a gazillion songs? Are you having writer's block like? How is, are you, are you sleeping in the studio? How has it been for you? Um, so I had this block of writing new material, like this time period for half a year. Let's just call it new material because I don't think I'm allowed to say yeah, album. Yeah, we something. don't want to, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and I was kind of motivated to, to travel a lot after it. And that was, I think, quite important for me to have the motivation to go here every day. So I kind of sucked when I couldn't do that. And I was kind of finished with, you know, like the, the material and um, I couldn't go anywhere. But, you know, at the same time, I thought, well, I'm just going to continue doing music. Like there's worse things than being able to go to your own studio every day and, um, you know, since then, it's just a bit slower, I would say. I, I enjoy how slow days are, and I, I've, I've got no deadline, and I, I've, I've got time to do a couple of features at the moment and production work for other people. Um, so it's it's pretty productive, but at the same time, almost the first time in many years that I've um, got no deadline for anything. So it feels really liberating in a way well um, th this time last year you were i mean you're you're one thing we're missing here is this is right in the middle of festival season and you were yeah you do a lot of festivals so how much do you miss being out doing festivals right now 
I miss it a lot, but the funny thing is this would have been the first summer we would play like almost none, almost no festivals. Um, there were a couple of offers, but we, it wasn't one of these years where we would want to play a lot of festivals because the album, you know, there were two festival summers around the last album. And um, it probably, without COVID, it would have been a couple of festivals, but more like maybe three or four instead of 20, 25. You've, you've always lived in Germany. You've never lived in... Because it's it'd be tempting to move to London or LA or New York, but you've always... Are you like Germany for life? I kind of wouldn't promote it that way. Um, because I, it's always tempting. You need like a t-shirt that says places. Germany for life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I lived in Berlin for a year and then moved back to Cologne and that was always because of studios. Like I worked in, uh, Gordon Raphael's, uh, studio, the producer of, uh, the first two strokes albums, um, first three, maybe even, I don't know. He kind of has studios all over the world and he, uh, there, there was a chance to work in his studio for a year. Um, that's why I moved to Berlin and then I got back to Cologne. Um, but I kind of like it. I mean, it's it's there's a lot of things I hate about Cologne and Germany, but at the same time, I feel home here. And I think I couldn't afford a studio like this uh, in other places. Um, that's for sure. Um, and I don't know, it's it's very easy and playing a lot of shows and festivals it feels like um i i need a place where it doesn't feel like hectic and even in berlin it it was sometimes too much of a feeling like you would walk around at a festival like um too hectic and too stressful and yeah cologne is a, maybe a great sweet spot for me because there's still a scene and there are things going on but um it, it feels a bit isolated from from the rest of the world in a way, in the, in, the, in the most positive way. Growing up, you were playing in bands. You were a drummer. Um, I, there's a rumor you were DJing parties. I want to know, what was your first childhood music memory like that you can remember? Um, the, the very first is actually playing piano when I was five or six. Um, and I pretty quickly left the lessons. Um, because I hated uh. notes, I hated cheap music, and I couldn't, I couldn't play it. You know, I remember p- playing along to like the Dangerous uh, album from Michael Jackson or like classic Beatles songs, and I, 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 I was quite, I was quite good in, you know, he- hearing a melody on TV or something and then playing it on piano. Um, like the, I was way better in that than you maybe should be with five or six when you just play. A bit of piano. Um, was there someone in your life that intro, like a mentor or mom and dad? Was there somebody that that gave you an instrument or taught you to play and, and made you spark in music? Not really, but I guess like I took a long break after those piano lessons and didn't play any instrument until fourteen or fifteen. And at that time, a lot of friends in my school started playing instruments, and that's why I picked up a guitar and you know, started playing the guitar. And that time was um, inspiring because we were all forming bands for like half a year or even just a few weeks. And then everything, I learned every instrument in that time from 14 to uh, 17, 18. Not not every, but like drums, keys, guitars, and bass. Um, I, I sang in a band. It wasn't because of any competition, but we all, like a circle of, six, seven people, we all just loved, you know, mimicking other bands, covering songs, and then also writing some songs on our own. Hold up, who, 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 we kind of, what did you cover? Who did you cover? Just, I'm just curious what, what songs you covered. Um, I mean, we were all like, especially I was like a big Strokes and Arctic Monkeys fan and um, wow. the White Stripes and stuff like that, that came up. So really like, indie guitar rock from like the 2000s yeah so different all kinds of different stuff all pretty guitar based i would say Um, but that time i guess we were all kind of our mentors because we kind of all wanted to impress each other Mm -hmm. and but in a really 
non-competitive way but um yeah we, we it was just so much fun because in the in the rehearsal rooms you know there were drums and then you would just after the rehearsal we would play drums uh for hours and hours um and we were all we didn't go to music school or whatever we just um you know kind of jammed all the time and i think that was important for me to get to know every instrument and um um for it not to not to come from a you know educational or academic background but from a really natural and um impulsive um you know feeling because you're german i have to ask did you have any interest in kraut rock and motoric beat noi those that that kind of area did you have any interest in that when you were coming up you know i it's the same as I'm interested in, like, you know, Western African music. It was just, whatever. it was a piece like of the puzzle. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it doesn't have a priority because I'm, I, I'm here, you know. You know, I had a couple of people asking me why I don't really sound like Cologne or Dusseldorf or something because that's, you know, where I'm from. And I kind of, I, I'm really against, like, having a certain heritage of your surrounding and your music like i'm against that if it feels like a something you have to do like it it's almost when i when i started producing my own tracks you know i think it was my aim to sound like something really far away um like i had this almost had this found this superpower to sound like anything i want you know and why would you why would you want to sound like you know, people around you or something. Um, and it's even in the scene here or like in the bands that come from me, it's not really present, but it's definitely something you are aware of. But again, not not um, not in a priority or something. You know, it's, it's cliche to say an artist has a bunch of different styles mixed in, but you truly do. I mean, there's that kind of Ibiza... Balearic sound that you kind of have mixed in you have that chill wave because you did collaborate with washed out earlier in your career on your first album and so you do yeah. have this mishmash of not just styles of music but regional music from all over the world how have you how do you feel about the way that your music has evolved since your first EP in terms of the sound that you've been able to establish I think I, I, it took me a long time to kind of find my sound. Um, but at the same time, this trip to find it is like, um, you know, probably what made the first EP and the first album interesting. Um, and I don't know, I, I feel like my, my, my sound and the way I produce it is like, a lot more important than with other acts like um whenever i'm asked like how do you write your songs or something i'm i'm always confused by the question because i don't there's no like um all these steps in making the music from writing the first note until sending it out to mastering they're like so connected to me i can i kind of thought it's I don't know. It, it was maybe I, I'm kind of naive with these things because I kind of thought it's like this with every artist, but then I realized it's not really the way anybody else or like n most of other people don't work really that way. I mean, you're you're gen you're genuinely hard to categorize. It's hard to put, and it's it's a cliche, but it's completely true. I don't really think in genres when I do the music. I you know I just really just do whatever feels right in the studio and i guess it's just a mix of all the things i like like i think it's as simple as that um and i think after playing in all these bands to come back to that with guitars i start i started djing in cologne at like electronic parties and um yeah i i guess I kind of wanted to write songs with vocals and guitars and melodies, but have that, um, you know, dance floor, fourth floor feeling in it. And the way it 
that kind of mix turned out is really without any plan behind it. You know, it's just how it came out, really. What advice would you give to upcoming artists and kids all over the world wanting to play festivals like you have and just rock out on stage? What advice would you give them? In that last, like in that period of time where I was in the studio every day, I kind of, it was the first time I bought a lot of gear um, and surrounded myself with a lot of gear, which, which can be really fun. But I realized, especially with my music, the, the, that kind of an unique sound often comes from limitations and like being in a room with a guitar and you have to pitch down the guitar an octave to make it sound like a bass or something like that. Um, something weird like that. Because all those, um, you know, like improvised recording techniques kind of formed my sound as well. So um, I was starting with a laptop and a microphone and I didn't have synthesizers. I didn't have wow. a bass guitar. Um, and I still did my first single. Um, so so I, I didn't have a studio and, and all that. So I think you can get quite um, distracted by buying equipment and um, you think you need a certain preamp to to achieve um, a certain sound and to be honest no you don't like it's way more important to 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 um just start with the tools you have because uh you have a you probably have a laptop and you have all the technology that you know cost a fortune maybe two decades ago and yeah first use the tools you have and trust your ears before thinking you need fancy equipment because um yeah even on, on on even in the time i was in the studio recently every day and working on the new material i i came back to pretty basic tools that would be my advice advice like Is, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm whatever a, you have uh, make something with it yeah i'm a photographer and demi's a musician both of us can relate to the we know people who just buy gear and buy equipment and buy the fanciest stuff and it seems like they don't make anything with it they just like set up they're just obsessed with setting stuff up more than they are with making something exactly yeah, yeah totally Thousand pounds. and it helps me sometimes even to get out of the studio with just um like i have a super small setup in my apartment and the the quality of, of what i'm doing at home is not different to what i'm doing in the studio um, it's just that I have different tools in the studio. Yeah, but sometimes it's even even better to have like a super minimalistic studio. Yeah, so yeah, just make stuff with whatever's lying laying around. Are those tambourines um, behind you? Yeah. I saw you playing a tambourine little... in, the, in a music video. I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, that's my little collection. Is is that's that so really funny. is that really your passion or is that like your number yeah. one? You're like <laughs> I'm just I'm really just at the heart. I'm a tambourine player. <laughs> well, um, my the first album, it's I mean it's self-titled, but I wanted to call it Tambourine Dreams, um, because a friend of mine said, um, "Well, you can't ever do a track without a tambourine because all the, all my tracks have tambourines, and it's kind of my, my favorite thing." And then I, I mean I didn't call the album that way, but then I called my studio that way back then. Um, For anyone who's which was has about 20 tambourines hanging behind him on the wall right <laughs> <laughs> yeah but now this studio is also called tambourine dreams um and i kind of wanted to yeah show off my my collection is there like I, it's I, a pretty I, nice I, thing to collect because um it, you can always fit a little tambourine and your hand luggage um so when there's time i go like in thrift uh, music stores and look for old it's a pretty interesting history because um you know, you find like a weird, you know, African tambourine and then they're also Asian tambourines and they're completely different instruments and they were played in a different way. And it's it's super interesting to, yeah. to get into that. Yeah, I was curious if there's like a market of if you can go on auction websites or on eBay and buy like 15th century, you know, some tambourine that was found in a, an archaeological site from the Middle Ages or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't go, I I don't go that much in it. Like I I I have 
I'm more into like practical tambourines that I can actually use um, and know how to play. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a fun little thing to collect. You you mentioned uh, producing, and you've done a lot of remixes for people as well. What do you enjoy about working on other people's music versus your own? I think it has a lot of a lot to do with the fact that I'm singing on my own music and I'm not really a trained singer. I wouldn't see myself as a vocalist. So um, I think all this production skills that I kind of um, learned over the years, I can't really use it that quick on my own music, it feels like, because I'm kind of, I'm kind of, you know, not really sure about some of the vocals and then it it feels like when I do a remix, I'm just really quick, you know. It it um, I always explain it that way that it uh, keeps uh, uh, letting like voltage to all the gear, um, and I use like everything at once instead of when I'm doing my own music, I'm kind of doing vocal recordings for two or three weeks, um, or like I'm stuck with something and I I'm not motivated to to work on it at the moment. Um, yeah, with remixes, it's just um, I can kind of use all the skills that I have in production and and kind of use all of it in like two or three days, and it's just a lot of fun to do it. And it, it's I'm I'm really free in it because it's um, yeah, again, it's it's it it feels quite nice to 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 be away from your own voice. With production, it's something else because it's I I, I think. I'm I'm just starting to do that. I've worked with a, a band from Austria called Bilderbuch, uh, which are quite big in Germany, or like, like the German-speaking area. And with production, I think it's like I think with remixes, I really try to do like a Roosevelt version of the songs, whatever that is. Um, and with production, I kind of try to go out of my comfort zone a little bit. It was just about doing the music and really about the song that they wrote um, and not about, hey, let's do like a Roosevelt uh, mm. version out of it, you know? And that was great about it because sometimes it's great to feel a little uncomfortable to, to um, yeah, to, to stay excited about things. Yeah, you... This one's for the diehard fans. I need your favorite color and biggest pet peeve. Biggest what? Biggest pet peeve and favorite color for the diehard fans. What was the second word? I don't know that. Pet peeve, uh, th- something that really irritates you. What what what's something that really irritates you that gets on your nerves? My favorite color is blue, um, but just because I saw a documentary about blue, and like just about the color, and it it was so fascinating because blue was this. For a while, there wasn't like no blue color, like you couldn't paint blue, like because the pigments they couldn't get the pigments. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it was something really rare, and I didn't really know that. And now I kind of get a lot of references in songs um, about it uh, because it's like quite a precious and rare thing, like it used to be. And uh, yeah, they showed big paintings where there was just a little you know small marble and blue and stuff like that because it it was the only they just didn't have the resources to do it so that kind of fascinates me and i think yeah i quite like i quite like blue i think and the thing that irritates me hmm yeah pet peeve is is an american expression so what does that even mean pet peeve pet peeve uh, yeah it's like so my pet peeve is Someone who chews with their mouth open might be a pet peeve or someone who, right. yeah, like that kind of thing. That's what she's referencing. What's your biggest um, mu- musical pet peeve? Like what musical thing gets on your nerves? Um, you mean in other songs? Yeah, in other songs. Like what sounds are you like? Why are they doing it this way? I think all those, all these like production um like, like these watermarks that like hip hop producers would do in the beginning of a song. Good one, good one. Uh, I hate that. Like, like, I, the, like the DJ Khaled really, thing. Yeah, I think there's clever ways to do it. For example, Pharrell always does these four 
four hits in the beginning in every song. So every Pharrell song starts with like theme, 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 and then oh, the song starts. Wow, you should, yeah, know. like yeah, somebody told me that's about, why about they do it. That. And, yeah, and that's his watermark. But, but he, I really hate it when when it's just um, you know something spoken in the beginning. I, f- I always feel like I'm listening to like a radio rip or something. Um, so like, leave the leave the beats alone. We don't need that watermarks. You're on Greco Roman, your record label. How did you get mixed up with Joe Goddard and those guys? And what has being on that label? What has that done for you? What do you enjoy about being part of that family? Well, they've been there um, from the first second on. So even at the very first show in Cologne in like early 2012, um, they have been there visiting me and watching the show. Um, and they kind of, I still don't know how, but they found C, my very first track on YouTube or even Vimeo, I think, uh, where I just put it online with like a weird visual video. And they found that and they kind of, yeah, were there from the start and kind of, it motivated me to have a label like that. And even to, I played, I started playing shows outside of Germany more than in Germany, which is quite rare for, you know, a German act. I think that happens maybe sometimes to an act from Brussels or like Paris and he would start through in England or something, but for a German act, it's just super rare. And I, I guess, it was because of that label that I started playing shows in London and I was doing like, I think one of my first shows were on tour with Teats. I don't know if you know him. A totally enormous extinct dinosaurs. Yeah. He's now based in LA and he was, uh, don't know if, no, I think he was living in, in, in the UK back then, but he was, that was uh, in the end of 2012 and I was suddenly playing like a huge UK tour. Uh, like all the O2 academies around the country and uh, then Shepherd's Bush Empire London, which is this uh, legendary big venue. And they kind of made it possible. Like Teed back then was on Greco-Roman and they also had Disclosure on the label. And, um, you know, I was a big Hot Chip fan and Joe um, put out his, or still puts out his solo, his solo stuff on, on the label. Yeah, so I think... Um, because of the motivation I had to 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 suddenly be touring, um, it it just helped me a lot in the beginning. Obviously, to 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 start it with a label instead of, you know, having to look out for a label who wants to to release my stuff. I was luckily I was never in that situation. If not an artist, yeah. what would you be? I mean, I I guess I would still do something with music, like produce other bands. That's a cop out, Marius. I, <laughs> that's a cop out she, I mean, the, if you it's, weren't it's in the really music the, industry what would you what would you be doing mm-hmm. doctor I, I mean to be honest I, I'm, I'm really lucky that I don't ever had to um, answer myself that question because I, I would be lost really I, I can't imagine doing something else before we let you go I'm curious what is what are your plans for the fall, uh, you know, it's it's improving a little bit here and there, especially in New York um, and Germany. You guys have we're doing did pretty well with COVID right away. But what are your immediate plans? I, I don't want you to like get in trouble with your label or your publicist, but can you give us any indication on what the next two or three, four months are going to be in terms of working and releasing music? Yeah, so um I can definitely say that, I guess, that I'm going to release a lot of new music. And Sign was just the first um, the first little hint. Um, yeah, there's going to be, let's call it a body of material <laughs> to be out. Good. Well, um, well I, the reason I ask is because you, you, know, you released your debut album in 2016, the next album 2018. So you're on that kind of two-year cycle where yeah. you do release one year and the next year you're really heavily touring and doing shows and then yeah. you release two. Well, what I can say um, is that we were planning a tour in October, November, like a small club tour. And we pretty early on decided not to do it. And it also affected the, sorry that I'm speaking so 
in codes or whatever, but it also affected the uh, release schedule. In sure, some form. sure. Yeah, because that, for me, touring is always so connected to the release that I didn't want to tour um, half a year later for the first time um, with, you know, the release already out there. So we kind of, yeah, it's not that we canceled that tour because it was just in the process of getting booked, but we pretty quickly said we don't do that because it's there's no way, if you're being realistic, that it's going to happen. And that was in March or something. So, um yeah, there's touring plan for next year, and we're going to announce dates soon. And, you know, I guess you can just wait and see if that's going to happen. Um, but, yeah, we're gonna. I'm going to release a lot of new music. Um, there's something out this month, uh, a new song. Yeah, with a pretty frequent rhythm, there's going to be new, new stuff out. Awesome. Well, we're looking forward to it. I'm excited. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us, Maris. I really appreciate your time. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Good night. It's Real with Jordan Edwards is presented by PopDust. Go to popdust.com for the latest in pop culture, music, and entertainment. And you can find my photography and video work at jordanedwardsstudio.com or on Instagram at jordanedwardsstudio.com.